All right, welcome to Bonehead. We have a guest today that I can't wait to ask some questions about some people you've worked with, sir. Sir Steve Mitchell, how are you doing today? I'm great. Writer, producer, director. Basically has worked in anything that is a nerd fantasy. That's true. Cartoons, comic books, movies. Yeah. 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 Uh, a jack of many trades and master of none. So well, normal... I- Go ahead. Jay. I, I was going to say, I think you though are 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 a new record for us because I think you are our, our first guest that has a very notable feature, in that you are probably our first guest that has had their own card. You, oh, if that's I'm not true. Mistaken, yeah, you are the the milestone comic series. By the way, Static is where I spend a lot of my money in my youth. So thank you and. Uh, that's uh, that's why I pay I have student loan because uh, <laughs> I didn't save my money. I spent it on comic books, but uh, you worked on comic covers, including for Static and other things. And so you actually have a collectible card with your image on it. Yeah, there. You want to know the story behind that? Yes, we I would absolutely love to know do. The story. And also, we've done our research. As if you can tell, keep going. <laughs> well, the fact that you that that the the Static thing, the fact that I just worked for Milestone alone. But also the card thing proves to me that you guys did at least some kind of a dive. Um, uh, It's interesting. When I worked for Milestone, um, I was inking for DC and Marvel uh, at the time. And I got a phone call from Dennis Cowan. I'm going to take the long way to the card. Please. (laughs) And if we interrupt you, we apologize. If you drop names and we want to do a little side, I hope you're good with that. I got a, yeah, I got a phone call from Dennis Cowan, who I had inked, I think at Marvel. I don't, I don't know if I ever inked a whole book of his, but I inked some of a book of his. And he was working at Milestone, and he called me up, and he, he told me about Milestone, which sounded interesting. Um, you know, diversity way before diversity was even an idea. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, there's a book that we're doing that I think you'd be really well suited to. And it was called Static and it was penciled by a guy named John Paul Leon. Uh, I'd never heard of him. I did not know his work. And I could have done the dick thing. But can I say dick, by the way? Oh, yes. Fucking A. Um, <laughs> all right, there you go. That's, that answers that question. Um, I could have said, well, you know, fellas, send me his pencils. But Dennis knew me well enough. And he said, uh, John Paul uses a lot of black, meaning shadow comic book terms uses a lot of blacks you know and again when you're talking about milestone i think it's important to uh, differentiate those things and you know dennis i think you know dennis and i knew each other socially and i i'm sure i complained about certain pencilers that i liked and certain pencilers i didn't like and the guys i always liked to work with were the guys who used a lot of black because uh i was taught that lighting is important to get right in the black and white part of comics and so i always gravitated towards that and it's more dramatic and i anyway so uh i said sure it sounds interesting it was nice that i got a call and so i started inking that book and i got to meet the guys and they were very sports oriented you know they had like team jerseys and you know, baseball caps and stuff like that. They were very marketing and merch oriented. And at one point they said, uh, we're going to do cards. I said, what do you mean? (laughs) I said, no, we're going to do, we're going to do creator cards. And I said, oh, really? People are going to have to photograph me. I don't want to see my ugly face. (laughs) And I hate being photographed. I'll just say that for the record. Um, And I said, no, draw something. And I said, really? Okay. So I, you know, we were all doing sort of portraits or versions of portraits. And so I had a photograph of myself that I thought was halfway decent. And then I sort of said, all right, I'll use that as my reference. And then, you know, what I did is I sort of put smudges on it. I think there's some fingerprints on it. You know, basically I did a, a card of myself where it looked like I screwed up where I was being sloppy just to, you know, get across the whole inking thing. And it was strangely kind of fun to do. 
And it's one of the few things that uh, I have done that is different from a lot of guys that I know. Because Milestone, to my knowledge, was the only company that did that. Yeah, I was I was a huge fan of Static, and, and I have some of the cards. So I was like, wait a second. Is this because I knew of, of your work in film? And I was like, wait, is this the same Steve Mitchell? So yeah. I was like, oh, it is. This it is. is so so I, I had to begin with that because like I said, I think you're our first card hall of fame carrier. Good job, James. Wow, yeah. Talk about a deep dive. Well done. Well, it's funny. So a little bit of background. We had David Scow on the show, and I'd been trying to get David for about three years. And what's funny is that I got Alex Proyas, the director of the crow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> easier than I got David. I've even know people who know David who reached out on my behalf and he wouldn't do it. And then finally he said, yes. Was and he we, reluctant to talk or, or I, oh, I think he did tons of other podcasts. Yeah. I, I, he, I, you'd have to ask him. He did tons of others and I didn't really bring it up too much to him just a little bit. Uh, there's another writer named Todd Farmer from Kentucky that took us three years to get as well. And I thought, oh, Todd, three years ago, that'll be easy. He's from Kentucky. We're from Kentucky. Bullshit. I got the director, Patrick Lussier, who was his <laughs> friend first. Happened twice that way. Right. But what I, I was trying to get to it is this happened really quickly. We usually have a little bit more time. So some of the questions I want to ask you may seem a little bit like the actor studio. I don't mean to. I'm just trying to get your frame of mind and how you ended up where you're where you're at. So sure. where did you grow up and what were your, inf- and not necessarily influences, but what was that thing that triggered it? Well, like we all up, have that first shot of heroin. Well, yeah, well, I grew up in New York City. Um, I, 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 I grew up in the borough of Queens, which right. uh, couldn't be any more different than the New York you would associate with the New York that you see in movies. Yeah, uh, It was very suburban. And I always said it was a part of Long Island that got kind of stuck inside the... Uh, city limits Mm -hmm. and um i'm not entirely sure why i became a huge comics fan but i was a huge comics fan i was a pop culture fan even as even as a kid i i I read comics i watched network television usually with my dad and i went and and i loved movies um part of it was these were all things i could do on my own they were sort of solitary uh, kind of things, but yeah. I was totally uh, won over by visual storytelling. I know that makes me sound pretentious, but uh, <laughs> no. I like being entertained. And you know, my dad, a greatest generation guy, was very interesting in that I grew up, and he would say to me every once in a while, he'd look at the paper, remember those? Yeah. Um, and he would say, "Yeah, you got to watch uh, Channel." or nine o'clock there's a there's something good on and my dad was a movie fan growing up in new york city he went to the movies like everybody else did once a week and so even though the word fan did not exist yeah my dad was a fan and so he shared that in a very kind of non-fanish way said you should see it it's good you know he would he just would see these things listed and he would tell me that they were good and my dad, most of the time, was completely right. And he had good taste. He had great taste. I mean, yeah. he loved Warner Brothers movies. Uh, he's a huge Errol Flynn fan. Oh. Um, you know, it's interesting, just the parallel between him and my, between my dad and Larry Cohen. Yeah. Who I made a documentary about. Larry grew up in the same neighborhood my dad grew up. They weren't contemporaries, really but they had the same taste. I once said to Larry, I said, what studios do you like? And he said, I loved Warner Brothers. I hated MGM, which- The Dream Factory. He hated the Dream Factory and he liked the grit of Warner, right? But but Warner's was snappy. It was peppy. The pace and the rhythm of their stuff was fast. And my dad liked that. And so I liked that too. But I also read comics. Um, I got a newspaper out to, uh, to support my comic book buying habit. Um, and then because I was interested in comics, I wound up going um, to, DC, to DC Comics one Thursday because they used to have a tour, the DC Comics Thursday after lunch tour. That's literally what it was called. Mm-hmm. And you would be ushered with a bunch of other fans in these offices and you would see 
editors look up from their work and they kind of go like, oh, the fans are here. I mean, I'm sure we were a complete irritant to, to them, but it was a way to get in the door. Marvel didn't have that. I tried, but DC was the fan friendly company. And so that's where I met guys like Marv Wolfman and Len Wein and Jerry Conway. Um, and I just sort of liked, I, I had this idea, I think I want to get into comics. And I had sort of artistic, you know, uh, inclinations anyway. And then when I wound up going to the High School of Art and Design, which is this fairly famous New York high school where a lot of pros wound up going, Marv went there, Larry Hama, I think Joe Jusco was a couple of years behind me, um, Ron Wilson, uh, I think Dennis may have gone there, mm -hmm. to name a couple. Uh, I remember going over to DC's offices, they were a uh, uh, two blocks away from uh, art and design one, uh, one I think it was an Easter vacation I went to go pester people I'm not entirely even sure why I did it I just wanted you know you know how moths are drawn to the flame and yeah the yeah Stephen King tells a story about you know finding books that his father had ran off when he was young of and there were a couple of Lovecraft books and him hearing a story when he was younger about Jerry Lee Lewis seeing a piano didn't know what it was but he had to get to it yeah, and he had well, to get to those books and then we all have the same thing there's my i can see it in my three-year-old and i'm sure my friends can see it too and they're because there's just certain things they're just drawn to and they got to get so to it i just like talking because i wanted to do it i like talking to professionals yeah and saul harrison who was running the production department in those days who i knew from the tour guy was about five four i'm six four i tower over him he scared the shit out of me. <laughs> you know, he was just one of these guys who strangely was in intimidating. And I was at DC's office uh, again on an Easter vacation. And, you know, he looked at me, he looked up at me and he said, well, if you're going to be here, you might as well make some money. Come in tomorrow. I said, really? And so I, I basically did two days of a tryout at, at the, on that vacation. And then they asked me back for the summer and I was kind of, now I, I had one foot into the business and uh, I kind of got in initially um, uh, through the production department uh, uh, route, you know, guys like Marv and Len and Jerry Conway. I'm assuming if you know comics, you know, these guys. Well, yes. I, you were talking about Marv Wolfman earlier and, yeah. and my other two colleagues here are the bigger comic people, but I got to moderate an interview with Marv a couple of years ago and he just couldn't, he's actually one of the best storytelling comic book people i've met and marv is the first one to say he has a terrible memory which is a complete load of crap it's a complete <laughs> load of bullshit and then him going right. off uh and then complimenting and then tearing apart uh modern marvel cinema was fantastic sorry one of my great experiences i, I, I listen i've known Marv for a gazillion years so mm -hmm. yeah i can i i get that anyway so that the fans were welcomed over at DC and that was how a lot of guys got their starts. And, you know, eventually I just, you know, I worked in production. I worked for guys like Neil Adams and Dick Giordano at mm -hmm. their studio. And then, you know, I, I was a terrible penciler. I was just not really good, but I was really good with a brush and a pen. And I said, I think maybe this inking thing might work for me. So that was my, one of my childhood dreams that was realized based on proximity because I grew up there. You yeah. know, I look back and I realize how lucky I was because a lot of guys who I knew that were my contemporaries moved there from places like Louisiana and Washington State and Las Vegas and Detroit, mm -hmm. places that I barely had any idea or understanding of, but yeah, so that's kind of how that's how my pop culture career kind of got started, at least in comics. Yeah. So what were some of the do you remember? Is there a specific movie that just kind of rang your bell? Because I mean, okay, yeah, yeah, because you were talking influences. Um, that's OK. I was just curious if there was one of those that, you know, most of us have one that I, I can't no, think of a better way to put it than just rang your no, bell. No, you it, walked out and you're just in love. I, I totally get that. And again, this was a thing that my dad turned me on to. And it's the the thing from another world, the uh, the right. Howard Hawks version, my favorite movie of all time. I literally have seen it at least three hundred times. 
Yeah. Maybe more than that, because I started watching it when I was, I think, seven. My dad turned me on to it. Uh, my dad was not a science fiction or horror guy, but because the heroes were uh, greatest generation Army Air Corps vets, he could relate to them. So was and he that, in World War II? Yeah, he was. Luckily, he didn't see any action. And he was, you know, he was he was in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And he said he'd seen a, a number of dead Japanese soldiers. But, you know, he was in the Air Corps. And he was back at the field, wherever the field was, working on the planes. But, but he could relate. Yeah. Because, you know, he knew guys like that. And so he said, yeah, you should watch that. This is a good one. And I, I fell in love with it. I mean, I think as movies go, the thing, whether it's that thing or Carpenter's the thing, <laughs> I think it's one of the great stories of all time. It's I like agree. it was. You know, I'm sure you guys have had this kind of conversation where you go, well, what do you think is like the greatest movie ever made from a, maybe a story point of view or an I story idea? Yeah. You know, Jaws is such a great idea. I'm amazed that it wasn't done earlier, but it was. It was called Moby Dick. Yeah. Uh, but the thing was a completely original, simple um, and unique and great idea. And the book or the novella is different as well. Who goes there but John W. Campbell. Exactly. And whether you're reading it or watching one or the other two versions, I think the prequel to Carpenter's movie is not that good, but it's still the thing. And it still is of interest on that basis to me. But that was the big boy in the block for me. And I still watch it at least a couple of times a year. The new Blu-ray that came out from Warner's a few months, some months ago is the best that's ever looked. So it's-, it's oh, I haven't nice. got it yet. Is it, is it a big improvement? It's a very big improvement. And there was a problem with that movie because Howard Hughes uh, recut it, I think four or five years later, they did a reissue and they, they cut it down from 85 minutes to 80 minutes. And the story goes, the trims, the negative trims were thrown away. Mm -hmm. And that's always been one of the problems with that movie, the 85 minute version, which is much better um finding 35 millimeter elements on that good 35 millimeter elements were tough so what happened was warner archives somehow found those elements and the new version is really good i don't know that it's as good as maybe some others you know um farewell my lovely which is another warner archive yeah thing. i'm doing advertising for them that was taken from the negative and the negative was really in pristine shape and that looks astonishing yeah. But the thing looks really good. And I, I, it makes me happy. I, it's weird. You guys have movies like that where the logo comes on and the music and the credits and you just start to smile. Yeah, you oh, want yes. to answer? Ghostbusters and John Carpenter's The Thing. Okay. And then Citizen Kane. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I, I've always liked, um, oddly enough, The Seventh Seal was one that, uh, for some reason, the first time I saw yeah. it, it got stuck in my head and and every I, I there's something about it. if it's on i'm just it pulls me in that and and a marx brothers film there you go okay. that probably says more about me than needs to be said that's an interesting combo how about you chad uh so uh a partially ghostbusters but honestly i uh as you'll see some some of my questions i'm a huge animation fan okay and who framed roger rabbit is one of my favorite movies so every time that that opening comes on i just get i just get gleeful you know, it's, it's interesting you ask that just as a real sidebar to everything, but it's a great thing to do with normal people uh -huh. uh, is ask them what's your favorite movie. Not the best, not the greatest, but your favorite. And I was with a couple of writer friends one day at a restaurant here in Los Angeles that, I, that we used to go to a lot pre-COVID for lunch. And they have a lot of actors, singers, dancer types as the waiting staff. And I turned to the, we, had, we used to have this, uh, she was very adorable Asian uh, waitress who was there usually when we went, because we went almost every week. And I just turned to her one day and I said, Kim, what's your favorite movie? And I expected her to kind of hem and haw. Mm -hmm. And she said, Splendor in the Grass. And I kind of went like that. It's amazing what that simple answer can tell you about a person. I That's think. That, no, I, you know what the question I ask, because we do a lot of convention work and moderating. Mm -hmm. is uh if if we're having a conversation i ask them their guilty pleasure the thing that you wouldn't oh, tell me tough. 
Well, no, Do you know what I mean? The thing no, that you wouldn't that. tell me, but when you're flipping through, you stop and you stop and watch it, and you love it. You just revel in it. You just you're just rolling around in it, and that yeah. usually tells me about. I'm with you. It tells me damn near anything you'd ever want to know about that person. My favorite guilty pleasure. I went. I, the first one that came to mind was Attack of the Crab Monsters. <laughs> well, that's Roger a good one. Attack, Roger Corman's Attack of the Crab Monsters. Again, another movie I watched on local TV growing up. But yeah. ask me tomorrow, I might come up with a different answer. But that's definitely a guilty pleasure. Yeah. So that was what that's what got you going. You were in New York. You are working in comics. Mm-hmm. Now, connect the rest of that for me because you're currently not in New York. Oh, to, oh yeah. Well, and we're then we go into we go into screenwriting. We go into many different things. So I'm curious, how does one connect to the next? Well, I think. The, my two passions have always been essentially film slash television and comics. Yeah. And um, you guys have heard of the San Diego Comic-Con, right? <laughs> you are familiar. A, a little bit. A little, I would think. A little I would bit. Think. Well, I, before it became kind of the pop culture extravaganza that it is today. Right. Um, I used to go out because it was a tax deductible vacation. <laughs> to a part of America that was not hot and sticky in July. <laughs> and one of the reasons why that I think that convention got great support from the comic book business is everybody, I don't know if you've ever been to New York in the summer, but the answer, my, my, my simple statement on that is don't go. New York, too late. <laughs> yeah, I know. New York, New York, like the, that's the, it's an East coast thing. I think um, is just dreadful in the summers. So I started going to San Diego before it even became a thing. And then I had a buddy, my friend, Jim Winorski, who's uh-huh. made, made who's been on the show. My old buddy, Jim, who I knew from conventions in New York, from fan, from in fan circles. Uh, he lived in Los Angeles. So I go to San Diego and then I go up to LA and I kind of, I mean, I love New York and it's part of my blood, but I really liked being in Los Angeles. And whenever I went there, I always had a good time. And I started to think, because New York was falling apart in the 70s and the Mm -hmm. early and the 80s. And I said, you know, maybe I'm done with this. And, you know, Jim kept saying, I mean, he used to call me, he says, when the hell are you going to move out here? When are you going to move out here? When are you going to move out here? And because of things like Express Mail and Federal Express, getting my material to New York was not a problem. You know, used to be you had to live in New York or or we we call the tri-state area Mm -hmm. um, because of delivery. I mean, you had to literally be able to deliver your work in in a day. So a lot of the pros, and this is not only in comics, but it's also in magazine and book illustration. All these guys lived in either New Jersey or Southern Connecticut or, or Southern New York State, the island or the city. And well, once overnight delivery became a thing, I didn't have to stay there. And then I just decided, I think, you know, I had to convince my wife to do it, my then wife. And I said, you know, let's go to LA. And we got married, we had gone out there on a, um, I guess it was sort of a honeymoon trip. We didn't mm-hmm. just go to one place. We went to a number of places and she enjoyed LA. And maybe later I'll tell you the, how I, how we saw star Wars before, to, you know, everybody else did the original star Wars. Uh. Um, but we had said, okay, LA. Okay. And I was a, I, I wanted to try and do work in film. <clears throat> Pardon me. I wanted to try to do work in film, but I knew I had comics as my fallback. Right. That, you know, I had a plan. My plan B was everybody else's plan A. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we packed up a 30 foot U-Haul truck and drove west. And I learned how to drive a stick uh, on the highways of America <laughs> in the rain. <laughs> Did you learn how to do it driving out of Queens? <laughs> no, no, no. I w- we were living in Manhattan at the time. Okay. And strangely enough, my wife had to drive the truck out of Manhattan because I, 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 because it was a stick. Yeah. You know, and and you so, grew up in New York. I did, but the thing about growing up in New York is, if you live in the city, you don't need a car. That's what I'm saying. You grew up yeah. in New York. Now I grew up in a 
we grew up in a rural area. So I knew as a child, but I completely understand my first r- roommate in college was from the Bronx. Yeah, there's no reason for you know how to drive a, a four or a five speed or anything like that. My oldest friend in the world, my friend Gary Gerani, who I went to high, art and design with, who was the co-writer of Pumpkinhead, and he wrote Vampirella mm-hmm. for Jim, in fact. Uh, he lives out here and he still does not know how to drive. He never learned in New York and he never learned after he moved out here. So, you know, old habits. But yeah, we, we sort of struggled to get the truck across the George Washington Bridge. And once we got to New Jersey, it sort of worked out. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chav's going to say something. Oh, no, 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 no. no you, you go ahead. So you drive cross country. Mm-hmm. You get a place and I'm, I'm just trying to, so a lot of times you're absolutely right. Your story is so different than so many people, not because of New well, York. It's just, I, thank, thank God I'm not boring then. You know? No, no, you're not boring at all. What, and I will get asked, it's funny that I have the Star Wars hat and you're going to bring that up because I don't always actually, there's like five different hats. I just threw one on because I was trying to get my kid asleep a second ago, mm-hmm. but I do love Star Wars, but you moved to LA. Did you just move in on somebody's couch? Did you? No, because no, no, you know no. everyone else is broke, but you're getting paid. Well, what I did was this: is we had sort of decided prior to a Comic Con that this was going to be the plan. So I went to Comic Con as usual. I went up to LA as usual, and then I found an apartment. Mm-hmm. And so I had an apartment to move to. Yeah. And so we took the Hindenburg, which was my nickname for the, for the truck. It was about 30 feet long. And my wife and I, you know, just, we had a destination, you know, it wasn't like, well, who knows where we're going to wind up? No, I had a destination. I'm a very middle-class guy. I don't want to, you know, I, that's I, what I'm saying. So that's, so part of a lot of the reasons why I think a lot of people don't, especially, and it's probably for me, it's like, hey, oh man, I just don't want to live on someone's couch eating hot dogs. It's not great. No, I wouldn't want to. It's awful because, you know, we have other careers, but then I, I, your story is so much different than others because you, you had, not that you're wealthy, but you're making a living. And what you already say is wealthy. I was kind of making a living most of the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, being a freelancer in comics in the old days was a much better proposition than being a freelancer in comics today. Uh, I don't know how anybody does it today, but it's not my universe anymore. But in the old days, if you were kind of like me, um, somewhat talented, dependable, easy to work with, uh, professional, predictable. Uh, <laughs> That's a good would, thing for a lot of people, though. Yeah, you would stay employed. You know, um, the other thing, I wasn't overly picky about what I took because I didn't want to hang up an editor at one of the companies. I mean, some, I, I, trust me, there are a number of jobs that I've done in my past where I go, God, why did I take this? God, why did I take this? God, I hate doing this. God, I'm wrong for this. Because I don't know if you talk to many guys who worked in comics, but you know, because of what I did as an inker, Mm -hmm. um, I was affected by who did the pencils. Yeah. And I think that great penciling and inking teams are what I would also call great casting. And there were some guys that I was not well cast to. I'll be, and I'll be the first one to admit it. And then there are some guys I was very well cast to, like John Paul on Static. I think mm-hmm. he and I were, were a good fit, you know, as an example. Um, but yeah, I had a plan. That was, I mean, again, I was married. If I was single, I don't know if I would have done it the same way, but I was married at the, at the time. And I felt that it was important not to sort of make my wife go through so, some sort of bohemian ritual <laughs> where you have ideas about. So yeah, that was the plan. And oh. then uh, do you want me to keep going with like, how did I get into the film and animation? No, music? no. Yeah. But or before you, you go, you separate questions. Before you go, James has a question, but I have, how'd you get into star Wars? How'd you see the early sneak peek? Oh, very simple. Uh, Howard Chaikin was drawing the adaptation of star Wars. And James is all excited. Yeah. Studio. It's over here. I've got a copy. And, <laughs> and, and seeing dozens and dozens of stills from this movie. And I said, what, what's, what's the deal with the stills? I think at one point he said, yeah, it's for this George Lucas thing called star Wars. And I was looking at it and I said, 
you know, it looks kind of interesting, you know, because I was into science fiction and stuff yeah. like that. So the set, there was no no effect shots at all of the of the the spacecraft or any of the, the dog fights. But you know, you could see the sets, you could see the weapons, you could see the props. And I said, well, that looks interesting. So well, as I said, when I got married, we went on this West Coast trip. And Chaikin said, when you get out to California, call this guy over at Lucasfilm. And I called him up and he said, hey, would you like to see the movie tonight? <laughs> and I said, yeah, sure. Because, because it's not Star Wars yet. No, it's not Star Wars. But here's the reason why I was interested and my wife was especially interested. Yeah. Was because it was a 20th Century Fox. Oh, it really? was the Daryl F. Zanuck Theater on the Fox Lot. Oh, wow. So as a movie guy, I'm going, Fox Lot? Okay, this could be the worst movie ever, but I wanted to go to the Fox Lot. So we go yep. there, we drive up, we park, we go into the theater. Packed. It was packed. And, you know, the place was kind of a buzz the way all screenings are. And then the lights started to go down and it got quiet like that. Hollywood audiences are very polite. Hmm. And so then all of a sudden, you know, I think you had the uh, 20th Century Fox mm -hmm. logo and then you got the, you know, boom yep. with the John Williams music and, you know, the, the legend comes up and I'm going, well, this is interesting. And then, and this is pre Dolby stereo for most of the world. Yep. This theater had six track stereo because it was also a mixing theater. All of a sudden you have the, the, the first spacecraft comes overhead and you're sort of hearing the sound go from the back of the theater forward with it. Uh huh. And you go, well, that's impressive. And then the star cruiser follows that. And there was a gasp in the theater. People were gasping. And then we saw Star Wars. And everybody walked out of the theater and I knew it makes me seem like I know I'm, I was being prescient, but no, I kind of felt this way that movies were now going to another level they, that, that movies as I knew them were ch going to change. Yeah. And I have a feeling that anybody who saw that movie for the first time had a version of that. But again, I'm seeing it in the perfect environment in terms of picture and sound. Um, you know, in New York, especially in Manhattan, stereo was kind of a thing, mm -hmm. but not in every theater. And I'm sure a lot of people saw Star Wars in mono for the first time, but mm -hmm. I saw it in six track stereo. And even my wife who doesn't really like this kind of stuff, she kind of went, that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had seen Star Wars two weeks before the rest of the planet, and wow, what a what a treat! What so, fo experience. so follow up question. Yeah. Did you by chance this movie? <laughs> sort of, the answer is sort of. <laughs> I said to my I said I said to my wife I said well I know where the car is. Well, let's kind of take maybe a longer way to it if we could, and you know. A, a, a studio lot is kind of weird. It's sort of very boring and fascinating at the same mm -hmm. time. Yep. Um, uh, a friend of mine, Mark Chirello, who used to be the art director at, uh, at DC Comics, he's still a very good friend of mine. He One night we were having dinner and he said, you want to go to the lot? I said, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, we can go to the lot. I'm a vice president. I can get us on the lot. <laughs> but we walked around the Warner Brothers lot on a Saturday night at about 10 o'clock. Wow. It's a very eerie, but cool experience, especially when you're around the, the, the street sets and stuff like that, because you feel like you're in an episode of Twilight Zone. Yeah. You know, you're sort of going, something's wrong here. Something's off here. Um, and Fox had a little of that, not quite as much as Warner Brothers. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I, was, I, was, uh, I was nosy. I, yeah, I was like that. I went, I went on the paid Warner Brothers lot. And let's say that there was a few times where my... Uh, the, the person guiding the tour wasn't paying attention and I kind of moved over to the left a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, movie lots are great. I, 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 you know, I, I did then and I still would love to live there. Oh yeah. It was yeah, amazing because of the history. It's just filling. Yeah. It, it, it oozes, it reeks it, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you, I, I've, I've always said that whenever I go to a lot, even during the daytime, I, I can feel the ghosts. 
Yeah. So James, you had a question and then I've got something after that. Cause I want to well, go. No, I, and I actually, I, I think you're already moving in this direction. So you're, you're there and, and I, I'm just going by timeline wise. Did chopping mall come first or kill bots or did GI Joe, which, which opportunity? You know, actually... I, I kind of got a sense you're going to ask that. And, and the answer is, I think the animation stuff might've come a little earlier uh, Steve Gerber, who was someone that I knew from comics, who lived in California, mm -hmm. was working for Sunbow. And his girlfriend was someone that I knew personally in New York, not romantically, but we were. We were That's okay. Good. We won't say a word. Well, we'll keep it to ourselves. I, I wish it was, trust me, fellas, <laughs> I wish it had been romantically, but we were pals and we're still friends. And, you know, she had said, well, you should ask Mitchell if he wants to do it because he loved, you know, we had written a script together, actually, a spec in New York that never really went anywhere. But, you know, she knew that I was interested in film and television. And we had lunch one day, said, you want to write for G.I. Joe? And, and I, I, I hate to admit this, but I will. I'm not a big animation guy. Yeah, um, that's okay. Chad's going to cry, but it's not, fine. No, you know what it is? I'm, I'm an actor's guy. You know, and the eyes are a big deal for me now. Yeah. Animation has come a long way. And frankly, some of the best writing I've seen in some movies of the late, late recent years has been in animation. But at the time in the 80s, animation was crap. It was. It was. G.I. Yeah. Joe, as much as we're of a certain age and liked it as a child, it's crap. It doesn't hold up. The animation it, does not hold up. It's, 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 it's really about fi the finances. I mean, some of the greatest cartoons I've ever seen and still think are greater the original Fleischer Studio Superman cartoons. Mm -hmm. You want to learn how to direct? Watch those without sound. They are beautifully made little movies. They really are. We were doing mm -hmm. G.I. Joe, the animation was okay, and some episodes better than others. But Gerber had asked me to do it, and I said, sure. And then, of course, what, what sealed it was, he told me what it paid, and I'm going, okay. I mean, it wasn't a fortune, by the way, but it was for the amount of work or so I thought it seemed pretty good. Yeah. Um, well, so you were writing and, and being, it's, it's just funny. Where did the writing come in? Because when you're talking about your development of what, what turns you on, what you're interested in, where you fell in love, you actually had never mentioned the writing and we hadn't really got it to it till this well, part. I, two, two things. Uh, very quickly, I did write some comics early on uh, in New York. Uh, I wrote some backup war stories for Archie Goodwin. Mm -hmm. uh, is my favorite person in comics, and uh, I think he was a, a genius. Wonderful, wonderful guy. I don't know if you've ever talked to other people about Archie Goodwin. There is only one person in the entire history of comics that was loved by everybody, and that was Archie. Mm -hmm. Not only was he a great guy, but he was also an extraordinarily talented guy and a great editor. Uh, creepy and eerie and blazing combat that he did for Warren were, were then and still are some of the greatest comics ever done. And so I started that. I mean, I was very, I was very intimidated in terms of the writing thing. I always felt I was not up to it. Uh, I knew a lot of writers. Denny O'Neill was a friend of mine. And, you know, Denny was this erudite articulate, uh, really smart, uh, you know, I, I thought he should be writing for the New York Times. I mean, I thought that this guy should be doing some sort of, you know, either film criticism or pop cultural uh, criticism type work. I mean, I grew up around a lot of smart people and they intimidated me. Mm -hmm. So I never had a lot of confidence. And then um, I didn't really do much comics writing um but i think it was always kind of in here mm -hmm. and when gerber gave me the opportunity he said he was very smart he, he knew how to sell it to me he said we're not doing cartoons we're doing movies that are animated and he yep. said i want you to write and this was for everybody i want you to write cut film you know, he said, I don't want the storyboard guys to be able to sort of, you know, go off in different directions. He said he wanted to control the shows on paper. So most animated scripts are somewhere between 25 and 35 pages. The G.I. Joe scripts and the Transformers scripts were closer to 50 to 60. I mean, I'm literally writing 
uh, uh, Lady J throws her ja you know, wide shot exterior, whatever. Lady J throws her javelin. Cut to um, blows up in front of some, you know, Cobra soldiers. You know, it, it was literally that. It was it was so specific. Yeah, that's what Gerber wanted. But it was a great way to think about writing because it it, it made you think about um, not only the character writing but you know the visual pacing and rhythm and stuff like that so it was it was great and um i don't know if, i don't know if i was any good at it but i think we did my wife co-wrote them with me my wife was a writer oh that, so barbara petty that was your she was your wife yes okay yeah yeah the eye the eye for an eye episode I, I, it's one of those ones that sticks with me so eye for an eye episode is my favorite because i just wrote it as as a piece of drama yeah and, and that's what it is. I mean, it's a it's a man seeking revenge. Yeah, um, that was my hook. Now I don't know if you talked to anybody about how GI Joe was done, but they no, was, we have oh, not actually. You're our first person. Who, and man, watch as I do this. <laughs> we normally talk to a lot of production designers, directors, writers for film. So we're actually real. Please take this as a compliment. Yeah, we're no, really and, excited and, to have you on here about it. Oh, yeah. No, no, I, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. no, just because, just to shed a little light. Please. What was interesting about G.I. Joe, especially, and Sunbow, the company that produced the show, mm -hmm. is they were funded, I think, by Hasbro. Yep. And the series was essentially advertising for the toys. Right. So what they did is that they broke down the toy line, I'm, I'm imagining, to where every episode had to feature at least X characters and X toys. Yeah. Now, that sounds kind of calculated perhaps, but it was smart and it was helpful because it would, you know, based on the toys, you know, if they were doing GI Joe Arctic or winter type toys, mm -hmm. that would steer your thinking towards, you know, how do I use that? And in eye for an eye, uh, I think I was stuck with some of that stuff. So I, I had the first battle take place in what I called this Alpine pasture, which was somewhere in Colorado. And, hmm. and that it was actually more helpful than not to be told what to use because there are a lot of toys and a lot of mm -hmm. characters. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that was great about working for, for Sunbow and GI Joe and stuff like that was there were no restrictions on action. You couldn't kill anyone, but the chaos and the mayhem and the cartoons were the same as any episode of the A Team. Yep, you know? actually, it was a lot more violent. It, well, it is. I mean, In that I said, sense of explosions and things because I didn't notice yeah. it. Once again, not to. I didn't notice it as much till. And Chad and I've talked about this till we show. Like I showed it to my son. I was like, oh mm -hmm. shit! I turned it off. <laughs> there's a lot of destruction there's a lot of destruction and, as, and long, as long as the bad guys can run away yeah we were okay and i said to steve i said hand-to-hand -hand combat he said well you can't have somebody kill someone with a knife but you know anything that's like judo or karate or anything like that was fair game so it, it was very liberating not to have those kinds of network restrictions um, I wrote, I think, one or two G.I. Joes after it left Sunbow and it was on a network. And I was literally told you couldn't have someone pointing a weapon at someone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, How do you, it's G.I. Joe for crying out loud. And, <laughs> you know, that's why we're paying you. Figure something out. Um, but, but the Sunbow stuff was great to write. Um, it, was, it was actually fun. Did they, and that's why, sorry, but that's why, like, those cartoons stand out in terms of 80s cartoons because they and i'm glad i heard about the 50 pages because that explains a whole mu a whole lot because those cartoons play differently than the other cartoons that were on the air i could list i could go off and list them all i'm not going to our audience has heard of me talk for three hours about cartoons <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah it was it's it's i just found that fascinating that that's how those were structured uh, because those G.I. Joe and, you know, on, the real Ghostbusters, those three stick out on in the way that their stories were structured. That were, are, you, are you saying Transformers? Yeah, Transformers. G, yeah. I would say Transformers, G.I. Joe, yeah. and the real Ghostbusters all they seemed were, structured differently. They were dense, I think. Mm -hmm. I think Steve wanted to try and pack in a lot of story into those. What were they, about 22 minutes? Yeah. 20, 22, 23, yeah. 22, and then they do those five-part specials sometimes where you were basically getting a movie, a long right. movie. Yeah. 
and and listen they were they weren't stupid they i'm sure they were releasing those as theatricals um i don't know if they did that internationally but i don't know either yeah. but it, be that as it may they were very smart and it was a good place to work there were a lot of great people there um and uh i know that gerber i think gerber shortened his life by working so hard and working like a <laughs> yeah. 75 hour day but he was very dedicated to doing really good work and i think you know even though the animation always wasn't great um they're pretty good cartoons they're you know oh yeah well, i remember watching them and going yeah this is better than average so that's the first half of the que first half answer to the question and then while i was kind of doing that i also uh, uh i got an opportunity to work on chopping mall yeah which at the time, it wasn't called Chopping Mall. Now, do you, have you guys ever seen the Blu-ray, the, the Vestron Blu-ray on that? I have seen parts of it, sir. I don't know if I've seen all of it, but we're familiar with Kill Bob. And we've had Jim on the show. Okay. And he's talked yeah, about, well, he talked a little bit about it. Well, you're friends with Wynorski, right? Yeah, I'm sorry? I said, you're friends with Wynorski, right? I am friends with Wynorski. Yeah. So I have a, before you get into that real quick, I want to ask one more GI Joe quick, real, real quick. So did they give you the character Bibles on each one of those characters or were you allowed to make up a lot of the history? They, they gave us a, a lot of material. Okay, cool. I was it just was, wondering because like, I was sitting there going, hmm. It, it was, it was almost intimidating. And, and one of the things that I, I tend to do is I tend to be uh, my buddy, Michael Hill, who I met, uh, when I worked on GI Joe, uh, he said, you're lazy. And I said, no, I don't want to be distracted. I only want to know what I need to know. And there, you know, they gave us a ton, a, a ton of reference, but you know, you have to sort of figure out the story and then go from there. Okay. Um, there wasn't any real continuity as far as I recall that I had to adhere to. So that was again, liberating. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to ask that before we move on. So back to back to Wynorski and you were saying about the uh, about Killbots and Chopping Mall. Well, yeah, which is the same uh, movie for everyone out there. If you've not was, seen it, I think I was inking. I was I was in my home studio inking, and Jim called up and said, "Do you want to go out and have coffee and talk about movie or something like that?" And I said, uh, "Yeah, sure." And we went to a place uh, not too far from where we both lived, where we could get coffee and pie, both very important. And he said yes. that, that Julie Corman approached him to do a movie for Vestron Video. And Vestron wanted a teenagers being chased around a shopping mall by somebody with a big knife. And I said, okay, I mean, I, let me tell you something. That genre got really old for me as a viewer really fast. Yeah, right about I, the time Halloween 2 played out, probably. I, somewhere in that vicinity. Yep. Listen, I loved Halloween. I never really liked any of the Friday the 13th movies. Um, it's not like they weren't good for what they were. I just, you know, I mean, Carpenter kind of spoiled me, I think. He did everyone. And, and um, but, you know, a chance to write a movie and a chance to get paid. Of course, it was for the Cormans not to get paid a lot. But, you mm -hmm. know, it was different and it was something I was interested in doing. Um, so we went and we kind of stumbled our way through some sort of idea about a phantom of the mall kind of thing and this is a fairly famous story and we were sort of satisfied with that and then jim said why don't we do it with killer robots yep and so i'm sure i did you know i kind of got a little bug-eyed and sort of did the okay thing and we sort of threw everything else out and then retooled it and put together something that was half outline, half beat sheet, because Julie wanted it overnight. The Cormans, Cormans, I think, always felt things could be done quickly. And sometimes they can, and sometimes they can't. But we managed to get something on paper. And literally, fellas, we had a go picture in a week. Yep. No script. Jim and I wrote the script in an empty office up at Corman's offices uh, in Brentwood. So I, this is a, before we get into back to, back to it, I want to ask you mm -hmm. out of the three of us, James is probably the more subdued than Chad, than me. 
and I, we've interviewed Jim. We have a few stories about Jim before and after the interview and with the interview. We had a good time. I'm you to you. You remind me of a little bit of our relationship of why would they be friends? One of them is soft-spoken and nice and kind. And the other one's Jim Wynorski. <laughs> And he was well, great to it. We we got a lot out of him. He's a lot of fun. The, the difference is, is like, oh, I would you earlier. You were talking about someone, and you was like, well, I, she was a lovely person. Oh, I wish I could have been with her. And Jim started out with, you can ask me about her. I fucked her. Mm. Well, she <laughs> loved it. And and Jim is Jim sort of has his public persona. I mean, he's basically a, a good guy and a sweetheart. Mm -hmm. He's got a good heart, um, but he's very outrageous by nature. Um, why are we friends? Well, we liked all the same stuff. Yep. His favorite movie is also The Thing. Mm -hmm. And we, we have film music, uh, a, a deep passion for film music in common as well. And we had sort of the same taste. I mean, uh, Jerry Goldsmith has always been my favorite composer and he's Jim's favorite composer. Marconi is a close second and all the other great guys, the greats are all, you know, we love them too. Uh, so we, had, we always had a lot in common, even though we're different kinds of guys. We have different rhythms. But somehow, um, you know, we were, we became friends and remained friends for decades. That is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I'm very lucky. I have a lot of friends who I'm, I, I, I've stayed in touch with and I'm very, very fond of. Um, you know, maybe if I had a family where I had six brothers and six sisters, it wouldn't have been as important to me, but that's not the case um but we're the same way yeah and and again when you when you i'm sure you guys know this as well as anybody when you meet somebody who's a kindred spirit where you speak the same language you tend to hang on to those guys or you're just stuck with them in our case but uh, well yeah. there's that too right <laughs> yeah and anyway so we we got a chance to make this movie and um, I always think of chopping mall as me going to grad school. I mean, I did go to film school in New York at night and, um, I took a sort of certificate course, but, and we did make stuff, but this was more my version of USC film school. Cause we were there from the, the, literally the inception all the way down to the end. And I, literally was there for every step of the movie i was on set every night um well let, let me go let me backtrack a little bit yeah. um we wrote the picture at rogers um and one day for lunch we and, and again i don't know if, if this is old hat or not you no just, no well i think our audience i know you're probably tired of telling some of it but i think our audience well, I just would love to be hear repetitive it to people but you're I mean, not being repetitive, repetitive at all okay yeah going. Anyway, so Jim and I are going for lunch at this place around the corner from where Roger's office was. And as we're going in, Robert Short is walking out. Now, I didn't know Bob, but Jim did. And Jim said, hey, Bob, have you got like a half an hour? <clears throat> because we may have a project for you. And Bob, not being a dummy, of course, is going to, you know, say money, work. Why not? Because that's how things work in, in California. Yep. So we went, we ordered lunch and we told him about this nutty movie that we were doing. And Bob had won an Oscar for practical effects. Bob was essentially a practical effects producer. <clears throat> and I think he may have won something for either Beetlejuice or Splash or I, I don't remember what, but Bob yeah. was, you know, this is the analog days, fellas, you know, mm -hmm. things had to be made. And so we told him in this crazy idea and he says, well, it sounds like fun. So I had, I did one of the early designs for the robots and my design is kind of a combination of what, what would the spawn of Darth Vader and a Sherman tank look like? <laughs> and that was one of the first ones. And it was at, I, to be kind to myself, I would say it was okay. And then a couple of other guys had come up with other designs and they were better, but they weren't, you know it when you see it. Yeah. And then Bob came up with the design and we all went, yeah. Especially the head. Yeah. The head had that sort of evil manta ray kind of look to it. And we were, we were totally down for it. And he just basically 
went out and made the robots while we were finishing the script. And then I don't know if Jim told you this, but um, we did the casting on the movie. There is no casting credit. We cast it. And I don't think he did tell us that, did he, guys? Yeah. He, re well, he really didn't talk about it too much. He didn't want to talk about well, that. Well, he's done a lot more projects than yeah. I have. But Chopping Mole was very significant to me in terms of when it happened. Yeah. The experience of it. And we saw every, you know, actor in town that qualified as a teenager. Mm -hmm. You know, they could have been 30, but they could have qualified as a teenager. I think Ben Stiller read for me one day. <laughs> and I gave him a little piece of directing. I said, you make a little darker. And, and he just really went really down into a very dark neighborhood. It was the scene where uh, um, Susie gets killed and they're in the restaurant licking their wounds. And he went really dark to the point where I was almost a little scared. But I also realized that this guy's good. And he went on to sort of, you know, prove me right. Yeah. But we, yeah, we saw, we saw guys, I got to tell you, we saw so many hot babes. Uh, it was very hard being a married guy. Uh, very <laughs> in that process, I got to tell you, um, Hollywood can sometimes be very distracting. I can imagine. And you know, uh, did he talk about how Kelly got the part? I, no, he really. I don't okay, remember. He I'll, barely. I'll, I'll, he I'll make barely glazed over it, right, gentlemen? Right. Yeah. I found that Julie and I had similar taste uh, in actors. Mm -hmm. But Jim was the director and Jim was my friend and he got me, he helped get me the job. So I, I made a decision where I'll fight for something that absolutely has to be fought for. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's, you know, I'm there to serve him yep. and to serve the project. And so he wanted Kelly right from the beginning, because I think he had seen her in Night of the Comet mm -hmm. and I liked Kelly, but uh, Dana Kimmel who I don't know if she's related to Jimmy mm -hmm. but Dana Kimmel um, who was Chuck Norris's daughter in Lone Wolf McQuaid came in and I liked her in the part yeah <coughs> pardon me I liked her in the part Julie liked her in the part but she wouldn't kiss anybody she didn't want you know I think that she had kind of a, a, a somewhat conservative uh, religious background, background? I think so. Yeah. yeah. And she didn't want to kiss anybody. And we weren't asking her to get naked. We just were asking her to maybe kiss Tony O'Dell. Mm -hmm. And she had good chemistry with Tony because they read together. And uh, Julie and I both liked her. And but when she wouldn't do that, Jim just said, it's Kelly. Let's get Kelly. Come on. Let's sign Kelly. Kelly's great. Let's go get Kelly. And we did. And Kelly turned out to be great. You know, Kelly, I think in many ways may have been um a, a gift for us because for some reason I, I've thought about the movie with Dana in the part and I don't think it would have been as good. Yeah. But I liked her in the casting and we were very, very, very lucky with the cast that we had. Um, they were all really game. They were all fun to work with. Uh, John Trelesky, there's a funny story about John is he came in and read for us. I liked him. I had seen a TV show that he had done called, uh, leg men uh i think they did like six or eight episodes on nbc and uh -huh. that, but I, I saw him and i said this guy's good and he came in and he read for the russell todd part but jim wanted russell because russell had been in uh where the boys are 84 mm -hmm. you know, typical hollywood even with jim he's like oh he was just in a movie i saw yep so i said well okay why don't we give john this part you know, like, I mean, it's a consolation prize, but I liked John. And <laughs> I don't know how he got my phone number, but he called one Saturday morning at about 830, which was really early for me because I almost never went to sleep before four. I've always been a night owl. Well, you're um, an artist. You, you, I'm sure you work at night too, exactly. right? And then I need a couple of hours to watch movies afterwards. Yeah. When I'm done. And so I get the phone rings and I go, hello. And he goes, Steve? Yes, John Trelesky calling, and, and it was very earnest. I'll never forget that, even though I was half asleep. I said, John, hi, uh, what's going on? He said, well, I, I appreciate that you guys gave me this part. And then, you know, I was talking to my agent. He said, you were gonna, I was going to play, uh, Gre is it, no, it wasn't Greg. 
I can't remember his, the character's name, but um, but I read for one part and I didn't get that part. Uh, could you please explain to me what happened? And I said, well, it, the part you read for went to somebody else, but I liked what you did. And I think Julie did and John uh, and, and Jim did, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to include you in the project, but in this part. And he said, oh, okay. And I'm going, oh boy, here we go. A disgruntled actor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we had him in it for a read through and he was kind of not happy. And I'm just going, oh boy, maybe we got a problem here. And once we got to the set, once we got to the Sherman Oaks Galleria, and he worked for about a week. We started to get to know each other and he had a great sense of humor and he was a lot of fun. And um, I, of course, I think I said to, I think I said to Jim, I said, I wish he was gonna be on the movie longer. He's fun to have around. And he said, yeah, I know, or something along those lines. And we're still very, very good friends to this day. And, you know, John is now directing uh, television. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. John was a very good actor, but I think he was embarrassed by it. <laughs> I don't think he had the requisite vanity or ego for it. And he kind of used it as a way to get in to direct. Well, he and, wouldn't be the first. No, we, and, not, and certainly not the last, but he was a very, very good actor and fun yeah. to be with. Yeah. They were all lots of fun to be with. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's no, you recording. Oh, you're recording now. Was hey, oh, we're was, stopping now. We'll finish this up next week. See you then, guys. Yeah. Was open paren, not was closed paren. Anyway, back to what we were saying. That was Mr. Mitchell. He was nice. He gave us candy and told us he we were his favorites. We actually will be finishing the, the interview with him next week. We've got a lot of content, and we'll be actually looking at, amongst other things, his documentary work, King Cohen, about Larry Cohen. And if and you've it, not seen that documentary, you have until we get to next week. It is available. The Blu-ray is out now. You can get it. Also available on Tubi. Absolutely. Get on Amazon, buy the Blu-ray. And if you're really sweet and nice to us, we may actually do a part three with him. So next week, part two, Steve Mitchell. Tune in. Was open paren, not was closed. This is an inside joke that none of them get. Well, I would if they would say, get on the floor and do the dinosaur, they would be with us. And this has been Bonehead Weekly. If you pick up all them dinosaur bones, you're going to get dinosaur. Grrrr. <sighs>